Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Mystery Theory. Today is Wednesday, so it will be soft spoken. For those of you who are new to the channel, Mondays and Fridays, I do whispered cases. For those that enjoy soft spoken, I try to share one every Wednesday. If you enjoy the content, please remember to rate the video and leave a comment down below. Let's talk about Deanna. I'm not sure how to pronounce her last name. I looked it up and then I forget. Um, but it's a B O W D O I N. Boudin, which with that accent sounds very French. But she was a uh, 21 year old that was at the time attending Arizona State University. She was described as pretty, very popular, and a bright girl overall. Now she was the best in her classes and um, for a good reason she was very dedicated to uh, her studies she was working really hard to graduate with honors Deanna was very close to her family, especially her parents, and they invited her for a family dinner on January 6, 1978. They went to this uh, restaurant in Tempe, Arizona. And around 9 p.m., they were done and ready to go. Deanna had plans. She um, was going to meet a girl. One of her friends had monastery bar. And she met her there and stayed until around 12.30 a.m. They had a great time. They promised each other that they would do it again soon. And they exchanged hugs in the parking lot. A little while later, Diana's uh, boyfriend arrived at her apartment with his brother. However, Diana's car was not in the parking lot, so he assumed that she wasn't home yet and left. He took his brother back home and came back to her apartment at around 2 a.m. At this time, her car was parked in its usual spot. He had a key, so he entered the apartment That's when he spotted 
Deanna on her bed. She was not moving. And he got this image in his head that I'm sure he couldn't erase for the rest of his life. Deanna had a macrame belt pulled tightly around her neck. And her face was contorted into a horrific death mask. She was bleeding. She had injuries in her chest that looked like she was stabbed. There was uh, urine staining the bedclothes and the room smelled He scared, really, rushed to loosen the belt and then called 911. By the time first responders arrived, he was doing CPR, desperately trying to bring her back. She was attacked, strangled, stabbed three times in the chest. She was also raped. And they would recover a sample. Who could have done this? Was the first question, really. And the beginning, of course, the police had two suspects, Deanna's boyfriend and his brother, who willingly submitted biological samples, and they were cleared. They had no witnesses, no fingerprints, and eventually became a cold case mm, with little hope of solving it, really. However, what they didn't know is that the perpetrator was hiding in plain sight. His name was Clarence Wayne Dixon and he lived 500 feet away from Deanna's front door. He wasn't a good guy. He was a serial predator with a long history of violence. He, in fact, he only been just uh, just been acquitted of raped two days before the murder. The magistrate who set him free was Maricopa County Superior Court Judge Sandra Day O'Connor, who later became a U.S. Supreme Court Justice. He found Dixon not guilty by reason of Insanity. Because of this acquittal, um, kind of kept him off police radar. Then, typically, police will look for this kind of guys around in the area where the murder was committed. But he was overlooked because he 
he wasn't registered with a parole officer at the time. And he just had moved in to the neighborhood. He got in trouble anyways, even not getting caught for that. He ended up in prison for burglary and assault charges. But in March of 1985, he was back on the streets. He was on parole. And on April 2nd, he ambushed a Northern Arizona University student in the parking lot. He was held, uh, he was, was holding a knife to her throat and then dragged her to cover of um, some trees where he raped her. To make things worse, I mean, this guy is completely out of control. And a few months later, he forced a female jogger from a path, again, close to the university campus. She was brutally assaulted. But this time, he expressed remorse for what he'd done. So he handed the knife to the victim and told her to cut him, but she refused. So then he told her to get dressed and leave. He wasn't ready to give up though. Over the months, he the same to at least 10 more women. And most of them did go unreported. So it could be even a bigger number. But his luck ran out. And he was arrested in 1986. He was convicted on multiple charges and sentenced to life in prison. How does this connect to her case? Well, by 1996, Clarence Dixon had spent over a decade behind bars. But he was keeping a secret. He moves where a, a foot on the outside really and moves that might just expose him for the cold blooded killer he was. And this move might put him in jeopardy of the death penalty. And why? Well, our victim's case had just been reopened and assigned to a cold case investigator. Detective Magazzini began his work with an advantage now. Now they had DNA profiling which was now the go-to method for finger, fingering criminals, and he wasted no time and sent the evidence for testing. So he got a DNA profile of the killer. The problem he had is he had nothing to compare it to. So he went old school, went through the list of suspects, Testing their DNA against the profile he had in his possession, but nothing. 
he wasn't on the list because he'd never been a suspect. It would take five more years before advanced and forensic really help put the pieces together. So by 2001, the FBI made its CODIS database. We talked about this before. It's available to state or local law enforcement agencies. He couldn't wait to turn in this inquiry and he returned with a match to an inmate. Three years had passed since that January night. Now, at last, the police had a name to attach to, attach to her murder. Clarence Wayne Dixon, who is now a 52-year-old former gas station attendant with a long history for violence against women. And that's when they learn that he lived so close to Deanna's apartment. He was Deanna's neighbor. Police believe that he was out that night looking for a victim when he spotted Deanna coming back from the bar. Deanna had stopped at the market on her way home and she was carrying her milk. They believe that he snuck into the building behind her Working in the shadows while she unlocked her front door, then moved in fast, grabbing her from behind, forcing her inside, and closing the door behind him. But there was one thing that was still not clear. Why did he do this? Diana, why kill her? He was known later on for leaving his victims alive, at least the ones that police knew. But police believe that Diana resisted him, and he was a thug who relied on his strength sharp blade to intimidate his victims, but Deanna was likely not intimidated and she put up a fight. Some people like him who commit these horrible crimes are unsettled by such resistance and will back away from a victim who fights back. And I wanted to make that clear. But he wasn't one of those. As a misogynist and piece of garbage, if you ask me. And by Deanna refusing, who wouldn't? But I mean, refusing to submit to him made him more angry. Police believe that her bravery cost her life. Now this piece of garbage went on trial for murder in November 2007. He was found guilty and sentenced to death on January 24th, 2008. And this 
took no rocket scientists. They took only 20 minutes to reach the decision. And he was waiting the execution at the Arizona State Prison in Florence, Arizona. Now, I've been on a kick of researching cold cases recently solved. Recently, it's a way of saying it, but really, you know, cases that took years to solve. And um, one of the things I've noticed is that these people cannot stay away. Think that if they ever got away with something, they'd stay away. <laughs> they try to lay low and enjoy their freedom, getting away with something terrible. But in this case, this guy, it's. <sighs> and it's not only him, there's a bunch of people that were convicted for a crime that they committed. 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and they are already in prison for something else. So, it kind of proves that getting away with it means nothing to somebody like this. That they enjoy it, and that they make it their way of life. Sometimes people, you know, get upset with me for what they think it's excusing the behavior of a criminal behind mental illness, but I tell you the truth. Everyone needs to be all accountable for what we do. And, um, there's no excuses here. What is done is done. And in this case, this was a piece of garbage, really. It had no excuse. The insanity that helped him in that trial didn't pan out for this. There wasn't enough to prove that he was insane. And just because you do crazy things doesn't make you a crazy person. So, it's a only difference between somebody with a mental illness, a real mental illness, and this kind of person is that, in my opinion, Somebody with a mental illness needs help and in my head has a little bit more hope than somebody who just do these things out of their pure evil heart. <laughs> because you can't do this and understand that this is this is not normal and this is not this is not okay this is just pure evil I'm glad that he was finally charged with it and he he couldn't get away with it per se I wish that we could learn more about people already in jail that committed crimes that, you know, kind of free the case from the police and the family and so many people that are still waiting for answers. So let me know what you think in the comments down below. Your engagement truly helps. Spread the word and 
share the videos with more people. Thank you so much for being here today.